Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's devotion. We have been in the Gospel of Luke for a while, and uh, now we're still in Luke, and we are in the 14th chapter. Today, we're looking at verses 15 through 24, the parable of the large banquet. There is a lot to this parable, a lot of spiritual truth. Remember, a parable is a, a, a teaching technique of drawing our attention to something that we are aware of and familiar with in the physical world and relating a spiritual truth from that. That's what it's, it's, a, it's very effective and Jesus uses this technique repeatedly. That being said, let's pray together and we'll go into the word today. Father, thank you so much for drawing us into your word. As we go into your word, may you open up our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say. And may we be changed by your truth to walk in the fullness of your presence. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 15. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to them, Blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, just backing up, the beginning of this chapter, Jesus is invited to go to the home of a prominent religious leader of the sect called a Pharisee. And he goes and eats at this gentleman's house on the Sabbath. That starts out a teaching that took place regarding the Sabbath, the first part of this chapter, verses 1 through 6. Then verses 7 through 14, he begins to teach on humility, and he tells a parable um, and gives a teaching to, that's directed towards all of the guests who also have been invited to this Pharisee's house. And then the later part of that section, he addresses the host of the party and, or the event, and gives a spiritual teaching regarding humility to him. So we're still at this person's house. And in verse 15, it says, when one of those who reclined at the table with him, they're still at this party, and they did not have chairs, by the way. They would recline on cushions, and that's how they would eat. So when one of those who reclined at the table with Jesus heard these things, he said to him, blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now remember, the kingdom of God was the message, the only message that Jesus promoted, proclaimed, and, and moved forward with throughout his ministry. The entire message was the kingdom of God is at hand, meaning it's available to you, it's close, you can enter it, repent, which is a command, to change and believe. That was it. That was the entirety of his message. The entirety of the message was about the kingdom of God. And then everything that he did with regards to healings and miracles and signs and so forth gave him authority or demonstrated his authority in terms of teaching what he was teaching. And when he taught, he taught about the kingdom. So everything centered on the kingdom. This man who was there, like most Israelites, most Jews, had an understanding of what the kingdom would look like based on their history. The kingdom for them was the area of land that God had promised to Abraham and that through Moses, God led Israel in to possess and as such, he was to live among them and dwell among them and have say over their land by way of the law. So this is what the man was referring to. Blessed, he said, is the one who will eat in this kingdom because as Jesus is promoting the kingdom, there was belief that he would bring it about by way of force in the same way that Joshua did in the Old Testament. As a result, Jesus says this in verse 16. Then he told him, a man was given a large banquet and invited many. Banquet, of course, is the kingdom. 
At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is now ready. But without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. I ask you to excuse me. And another said, I just got married and therefore I'm unable to come. So the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, maimed, blind and lame. Master, the servant said, what you ordered has been done. There's still room. Then the master told the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and make them come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those people who were invited will enjoy my banquet. Now, there's a pr very profound teaching. Let's take a look and break it down a bit. He tells them in verse 16 and 17, a man was given a large banquet, invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who were invited, come, because everything's ready. The kingdom is ready. You don't have to wait. It's available, and it's always available in the now. The kingdom is to be experienced in the now. You can know about it and plan for it and realize that it will be there in the future, but you experience it now. Then... In verse 18, without exception, they all began to give excuses. And their, their typical excuses with regards to the reality of this world and, the, and, and living in this world. The first excuse is, the first one said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. I ask you to excuse me. He is invested in a field. The field is there to make money. It is a money-making endeavor. It's no different than an investment that one wants to go check out in their portfolio. The second one, this is another in verse 19. I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. I ask you to excuse me. So it's another purchase. It's another investment. The oxen will actually be able to do more work depending on the size of the person's fields. And so this too is an investment. And another said, I just got married and therefore I'm unable to come. Meaning I'm starting a life now and this life with my wife will bring me to a different responsibilities and a different chapter, if you will, a different phase of my life. Normal, all things that are normal. But He's giving this example to demonstrate something very profound. It's not that these things are bad in and of themselves, but entrance into the kingdom is more important. It's not that these are bad. We live in a world in which we engage in these things. You have to. It's the world in which we find ourselves in. They're not bad but they cannot surpass or replace the priority of seeking the kingdom. The kingdom of God is what God has say over. And through Jesus, we begin to live a life in which God has say through his word and through his spirit over every aspect of our life. And as we put his teaching into practice, his teaching has say over our life and his teaching and his spirit and himself is eternal in nature. So we begin to live a life that is eternal in nature. Jesus refers to it as eternal life. Eternal life does not start the moment your body takes its last breath. Eternity does not start with the last beat of our heart. Eternity starts 
when we begin to surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus and trust in him. This is repentance and both and trust. You cannot have repentance without trust. If you try to do repentance without trust, you're trying to quote unquote, do repentance from your own resources. And that just leads to pride and it will never work. So the eternal life that Jesus is referring to, this kingdom, is a kingdom that in Jesus' words as we read in the Gospel of John, is not of this world. That doesn't mean that it can't affect this world or that we can't live in that kingdom while we're also living in this world. It's just different. In the spiritual realm, God has say in his presence over everything. In his presence in the kingdom where he dwells, thy kingdom come. And we're putting that reality, we're bringing that reality into this world and we're bringing ourselves into that reality. Um, I believe it is the Paul's letter to the Ephesian church that Jesus is bringing together things in the heavenlies and things in the earth. He's bringing them together. And as such, there is a priority because... The things of this world will pass away. It is under the law, if you will, of sin and death. In the same way that everything in the physical world is under a law of gravity, it is under a law of corruption. It is in a constant state of decay. But in the heavenly realm, that is not in play. And eventually, in the resurrection, in the resurrection, those two realities merge and the physical takes on the properties that God originally had in play for this world in Genesis 1 and 2. There's no death in the new reality. There is no work as we understand work in the next reality. Working is good. We are designed to work. That's Genesis 1 and 2. But because of sin, we have to rely on our own resources or, or struggle against the curse that's put on the land. And so as we see in Genesis 3, we work by the sweat of our brow. In the new order of things, we don't. We work under the complete direction and resources of God's grace. There's many things to be said about that. The point being here is that what Jesus is referring to in the, and telling them this parable is that there are certain things that, are, that just simply come with living. Other investments, because most of our lives are spent either sleeping or working. That's most of our lives. But there is a greater reality that is at play. And as we seek it, that reality becomes the defining, the defining reality of our lives. That's why Jesus says in, in his teaching to seek the kingdom of God first. It's the most important thing. And everything else will fall into place. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today. I cannot wait to get into... Um, the next section of scripture of this chapter where we're talking about the cost of following Jesus. Um, the first disciples had to literally physically follow him. We do it similarly, but it's spiritual in nature, but it takes the same level of commitment and determination that the first disciples did when they had to follow him physically. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your kingdom. May our heart's desire always be to seek, to seek your presence and to listen and to become the kind of people that naturally obey. This we pray in the name of your son who has given all for us that we may be able to give all of ourselves to you. Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.